transfer us to the next panel, which is called Teleffect. And the first speaker in this panel, Ksenia Fyodorova, will be talking about Sense Act and Proprioceptive Act. Ksenia, you're welcome. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Natalia, and all the organizers for inviting me here. It's really a pleasure to be in such a wonderful company and yeah, spontaneously organized event, relatively, but yes. Yeah, so yeah we, we are surprised ourselves that it all <laughs> came together. Right. So I'll also share my not too wonderful uh, slides, unfortunately. All right, that's all right. We are all excited. I'll be uh, reading a little bit. Um, yeah. Oops, excuse me. Okay, I'll, I'll leave it right now because I also want to see my notes, if you don't mind. So um, what I actually wanted to uh, start with is, um, well, of course, introducing the <laughs> topic. Um, so sense act and proprioceptive art, uh, but also making connection to what I've been working on for a while. And I think the connection is quite obvious. So I have a book coming out um, uh, right this um, August, September on tactics of interfacing. And what we are discussing today, I think in the condition of uh, telepresence, yeah, so uh, this new distance uh, that connects us is at the same time. So of course it is our new uh, uh, yeah, condition of an interface. And uh, what I've been discussing in this book is a lot of art examples, um, but basically also the uh, whole concept of um, an interface is first of all, uh, not in a technical sense, but a condition that structures our being um, of a human as relational. So I'm talking uh, basically about uh, human relations and art as uh, creating uh, yeah, all kinds of metaphorical structures for modifying them and um, and so on. And um, uh, since our uh, session right now is called uh, Tele um, Effect, so uh, for me, I think most interesting type of effect is uh, the one associated uh, with the unknown. Uh, so, yeah, uh, cognitive scientists uh, talk about yeah, very particular schemas uh, uh, related to our emotional structures, affective and so on, but uh, I think we should have more flexibility about that. So spatial distance, inability to share the same space, like right now, yes, and yet uh, the luxury of sharing the moment uh, in time also as right now, is uh, also a great source of uh, the unknown. And uh, the anxieties um, are yeah, related to what comes in a second, uh, and uh, also projections. I propose to ground this uh, discussion of uh, teleaffect also in this uh, very intimate process of uh, sensation. And uh, what we are looking at right now is uh, tongue. So, uh, and the, the structure um, of uh, sensors, uh, that allow us basically to uh, feel taste. But at the same time, uh, so from sensation, we can, uh, through this word uh, sense or sensing, yeah, make to the very important idea of making sense. And uh, this will help, um, I think, also uh, to shift or expand the scale and conceptual framework, maybe, of uh, this discussion, shifting from the ontological conditions like space, time, body and its physical limitations or opportunities to uh, experiential aesthetic, yes, and also what I'd like to uh, call media ecological um, conditions or dimensions. Today we're dealing with the new forms of sensing and making sense that emerge at the interface of the organic and the technological. These forms have the capacity to productively challenge and expand our notions, um, um, our understanding of what has been at the roots of the aesthetic project as, for instance, a field of study, so namely aesthesis, uh, sense perception. One useful context for such an inquiry is a media ecological approach. What makes it important uh, is its emphasis on relations. 
So that's why I introduced my work as work on interface. Yes, but for that, uh, that for me is first of all relationality. Yes, so this relational condition and relations between different agencies and the uh, ship um, that uh, fundamentally shifts um, the role of subjectivity. Whereas the cybernetic paradigm saw feedback as a basis for regulation and control of a system according to a certain goal, such very teleological approach cracks down in face of the stronger agential potential recognized in technical objects by uh, thinkers like Gilbert Mandon, yes, so I'm, uh, showing one of his major books here, and later her worked, of course, uh, for instance, in vector network theory that uh, Stellark already mentioned today by Bruno Latour. A relational onto epistemologists, as we can call them, inspire a fundamental reconsideration of the concept of ecology in general, calling for ecology without nature, like by Timothy Morton, or what um, Eric Hurl, a German scholar, philosopher uh, following actually Felix Guattari, uh, theorizes as general ecology. The horizon of the technological condition is closely related to, the, uh, to a shift in thinking about subjectivity itself, uh, not as an entity, but as heterogenic and transversal. So again, we saw that today with the examples of um, great um, artworks, for instance, by Stellar, but also by the others. Yes, we, are, when, uh, we can talk about the, so the, um, the extension of the body, yes, so the subjectivity related to the body through uh, opening it up to uh, the possibilities of control from the outside, yes, or the collective subjectivity of the participants of Maurice Bina Yun's installations and so on. Uh, there is no univocal causality between a subjective will and an environment in which it operates. Rather, the subject should be seen as composed of multiple interconnected forces with the potential for transformation and even transmutation. So the concept of Simandon. This poses a productive challenge to contemporary aesthetics. Indeed, dimension is one. Um, indeed, the aesthetic dimension is one of the key ones here. What enables the uh, contact of a system with an external environment in the first place? Uh, so it, it's it's a rhetorical question, yeah. So and it, it is uh, basically um, aesthetics. What does that? Um, what are the kinds of sensory and interpretative capabilities of a system besides establishing an encounter? Uh, for instance, making it a fact, sensing and sensation facilitate a qualitative relation or a judgment. As the field of biosemiotics has been demonstrating, starting from the writings of Jakob von Uxkühl, that uh, I'm um, pointing at right now for you, uh, abilities of interpretation, learning, memory, as well as uh, um, making decisions and acting, can be manifested already at the cellular level. So uh, at the level of an organism, but also very micro level, yes, so of a living uh, being. But uh, analogous processes can be observed as happening at the level of matter organized as sensing technologies, or rather as technologies, yes, yeah, sensing technologies. Uh, like electronic sensors for detecting sound, spatial proximity, temperature, and other signals through registering electronic waves activity. And uh, here, um, sorry, I'm giving you a, a lot of books to look at, but why not? So Program Earth is also a current uh, classic on this topic and uh, how it modifies our understanding of also ecological condition. Yes, yeah, something that has been uh, also wonderful explored uh, these days at the critical zone exhibition at the Sutkaya uh, curated by Bruno Latour. Um, Luciana Parisi, in her account of what she names the technicologist of sensation, describes sensation as a fixation of a moment of change of state as the arrest or, or uh, snapshots of perceptual motion, the residual rhythm tra traversing the sensing thinking regions of a body. What does it mean? She emphasizes a non-subjective and even pre-perceptional level of sensation. 
the process of uh, differentiation inherent in uh, sensing cannot be described by means of signification. So it's a bit complex phrase, yes, maybe, but um, uh, I'll explain what it means. So sensations are other events. So they're, uh, they don't have to mean something right away, yes, but first of all, their facts, their events, and their significance lies in their operational potential. Namely, their very acting creates change, effects and affects. Um, sorry. Active power of uh, sensing operation um, can also be described um, in terms of performative epistemology, a term that philosopher and sociologist of science Andrew Pickering used regard, um, in regard to cybernetic thinking. Um, to cybernetic thinking, um, implying that knowledge is produced in the act. He refers, for instance, to the performative conception of the brain within cybernetics, a brain whose main function is adaptive. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, according to him, we can speak of performative ontology, mm -hmm. introduced also in his view by uh, cybernetics. Oh, sorry, missing up my slides here a little bit. Um, Sense Act thus uh, builds on already existing. Um, uh, on the, uh, this uh, well-established uh, tradition of sh shifting the emphasis uh, from what is sensed to the very fact of uh, sensing taking place. Uh, oh, excuse me, I'm just very well versed in this. Um, one of the uh, first, um, um, one of the inspirations for the possible theory of sense acts is, of course, John Austin's conception of uh, speech acts, an idea that spoken statements uh, such as placing a bet or announcement of a marriage create facts, including in a legal sense. But the power of performativity, uh, an act uh, generating an autonomous event, has um, been extended to also other phenomena. So there are theories of image act or build act uh, in German tradition of art theory, uh, art history, so Bildwissenschaft um, instigated research into operativity of an image in fields such as design or science studies. In philosophy, a theory of acts of thinking by a colleague of mine, Aloysia Moser, an Austrian philosopher, uh, has been developed in relation to uh, Kant and Wittgenstein's uh, philosophy how, uh, of how uh, thought um, as a dynamic uh, process yeah, uh, is being uh, formed and um, where what matters is uh, pragmatic and not semantic considerations, namely that a thought is being thought and not what kind of thought um, this thought in fact is. So, yeah, I'll move to the second part of uh, proprioceptive art, but also here relating it to uh, sense act directly. Yeah, so uh, continuing this uh, simple uh, schema, uh, proprioceptive act. Um, and here we're looking at the uh, example of Alphonse uh, Schilling, uh, an Austrian artist, uh, so who did these experiments with his uh, vision, so augmenting his vision through this uh, ZE machine and yeah, um, how he called them. So proprioception in a very basic uh, sense means um, uh, feeling your body in space, yes. Yeah? So feeling the position of of, of, um, of the body in space. Um, so how different limbs yeah, are positioned in relation to each other, but also um, how yeah, we as a body relate to the surrounding uh, space. So uh, freely uh, place around us. So that can happen through vision, but then what if we modify our vision like Schilling is doing here, or like um, artists experimenting with augmented reality are doing like Tamika Thiel, uh, Thiel with fractured vision. So where she's uh, kind of 
simulating, emulating maybe uh, so certain uh, visual disorders. So this multiplication of an image. Yeah, and um, in terms of proprioception, uh, augmented reality art is actually a good example because um, it's been theorized uh, nowadays in terms of a gestural uh, gaze. So we need to move in order to see. And it was actually great to see Maurice Benayoun's example of uh, uh, people also uh, moving in front of an installation in order to operate an image. Yeah? Uh, so sensation in space becomes really operative in terms of moving uh, the content of the installation. Um, so, and um, uh, as I already said, yeah, so it's uh, basically a uh, sixth uh, sense uh, so of, of, of the body, um, so the, the inside of uh, the body, so the, the neurons uh, within the muscles themselves are uh, telling uh, the brain, so what they're feeling, basically what they sen sense. Um, and what they make, maybe what, what kind of sense they make of those sensations. Uh, so movement is uh, crucial for proprioception. So that's why gestural gaze, yeah, operating an image uh, through movement is also relevant. But um, it's uh, interesting that movement, as Albert Michaud, Michaud a uh, French uh, thinker, states uh, movements may survive uh, the removal of its very object. Yeah, so we keep the memory of the movement even if when the object of movement is gone. So uh, yeah, don't want to go too deep into uh, philosophy anymore. Uh, and yet to return to the uh, topic of this panel, yeah, teleaffect, I think it's also relevant to uh, think of uh, this um, um, a psychologist and uh, yeah, psychoanalyst, uh, physiologist, um, Paul uh, Schilder, who wrote back, well, 70 years already about um, body, uh, well, it's translated as body image, yes, but actually he was talking about corporal uh, schema. So what later inspired also Merleau-Ponty to write about kind of this inner sense of uh, the body. Yeah? So not external image of oneself, but this, um, uh, yeah, um, more authentic, yeah, more intrinsic uh, sensation within the body and before it being interpreted by consciousness. So uh, Schilder talked about the body um, schema or body image as not only a picture of the body, but really an anticipatory plan uh, for the detailed movements uh, the body must undertake in order to act. So I think it's interesting also uh, for us in, in terms of uh, yeah, um, thinking about affect as uh, yeah, this anticipation, yes, and all kinds of uh, feelings related to uh, that, again, the, the unknown. Um, um, here I'd like to give a few examples uh, of also, we can say, telematic um, art, yeah, uh, on this topic of uh, connecting, connecting um, at a distance. So this, um, yeah, quite successful, well-known installation by uh, Rafael Lozano Hammer, border uh, tuner, a uh, very large uh, scale participatory art installation designed to interconnect, um, interconnect um, the cities of El Paso in Texas and the Mexican city right across the border from that in Tijuana. Uh, each of the interactive uh, border tuners, uh, tuner stations uh, feature a microphone, a speaker and a large wheel um, or dial. And as a participant turns the dial, uh, three nearby searching uh, search lights create an arm of light that follows the movement of the dial. So here we have again, like uh, in gestural uh, gaze, yeah. Uh, so when when the image appears, only when you position your hand in a certain way. So here, this dial becomes also an, an extension of your wish to connect and to connect across the border with the other members of your community. So I assume maybe Spanish-speaking uh, communities were using this um, installation a lot, um, or at least that's. Um, uh, one of the ideas behind 
uh, to uh, really bring up this question of the border yeah, and the means of crossing the border. So, and here it's done through this uh, searchlights, yes. So that automatically scan the horizon and search for the uh, uh, arm of light connecting from the other side of the border in order to literally touch um, or at least touch in light, yeah, uh, visibly, this um, uh, partner <laughs> arm, so to say. So they meet uh, in the sky, mm -hmm. and as they intersect, um, uh, the people on the ground actually can hear each other. So the microphones and um, speakers start working. Um, um, water tuner is not only designed to create new connections between the communities on both sides of the border, as Lazana Hammer writes, but to make visible the, um, the relationships that already uh, exist in place, uh, magnifying exist, um, these relations, conversations, but also cultures. So, um, Ksenia, one minute left. Yes, I'm almost done. Mm -hmm. Just a few more pictures on that. And um, yeah, so this also brings us back to this idea of that proper perception is based on already existing real experiences, physical, psychological, or cultural. But what if we are talking about communication, not only between people, but between non-human species, like in this case of Olga Kiselova, sorry for spelling it in Russian here. Um, but we know it's her. <laughs> yes, well, for those who don't know, so uh, you should, uh, so this installation about connecting trees across continents. Um, so what if, um, so we're considering this kind of communication between species and even more radically communication between the humans and the non-humans. How adequate is our feeling of each other at a distance with these yeah, non-humans? Not only physical, but uh, um, trans-species distance is here at stake. So how do uh, sense acts uh, actually translate? And what I want to finish with, um, well, sorry, uh, another uh, artwork, I, uh, <laughs> but it's actually about the power of imagination. So the power of art, of course, but um, yeah, so these uh, uh, problems of translation between species, between languages, between spaces and times. So I think this uh, piece uh, is a, um, yeah, a nice illustration of that. So uh, French artists um, Annie Viguer and, uh, and um, Franca Perrotte, uh, Topologie, and uh, the participants uh, who were actually trained uh, parkour uh, performers, uh, so had to uh, walk um, on in real cities, yes, yeah, so on real territory and not on a map, with images. So, and why I think it does relate to imagination, um, yeah, and um, uh, why it's interesting to finish with that, um, uh, because there is um, this question or yeah, allows us uh, to uh, think more about uh, that, uh, what constitutes affect here uh, is maybe an amalgamation, a fusion of different spatial, temporal, but also the immediately given in sensation and the abstractions in our mind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ksenia, for bringing also the uh, spatial perspective and interspecies perspective into our tele-effect picture. So uh, at this point, I would like to give words to William. You are very welcome. Well, thanks very much. It's been a, it's been a really wonderful, in a certain way, unexpected um, last hour and a half. Uh, not unexpected because of the domain, but more unexpected because this has been a really, it's been a very useful way to show the power of art as a way to interrogate things that words have a really hard time doing. Our word culture is rooted in a hermeneutic tradition. We, we deal with things like representation and talk endlessly about it. And there's a parallel development, a parallel sector that seems to fall outside of discourse a lot, and that's the world of presence. Um, and telepresence is a way to get at that. But I'm really struck by how, from so many different vectors, uh, people today have been sort of talking about this space that's a little bit ineffable. Again, we don't have a good vocabulary for it. Um, anyway, let me jump into the screen. Um, oh yeah, let me say something else. Um, I won't talk about it here. 
But I just finished a study that's coming out also with MIT Press as a book called Collective Wisdom, and it's about co-creation. And one of the chapters is about co-creating with biological organisms and with artificial intelligence systems. And it just seems to resonate with so, so much of what I heard this morning uh, has come through that, come through that lens. Uh, if you're interested, it's free and online um, until they start to sell it as a book, but whatever, let me jump into the screen. Uh, yeah. How can this be? How can I have so much crap on my screen? Does that work? Are you seeing a title? Yeah, okay. Um, good. Now, if I can figure out how to make this thing work. Should be a five. I'm sorry? Should be a five to open the full screen. Uh, where you can uh -huh. network. Okay, Perfect. here we are. This is what I face. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a historian and I'm a professor. I'm not an artist. This is what I face right for the last two months. This kind of ensemble has a very deep history. Um, and Albert Robida, among others, has, has kind of given us a hint of, of uh, the possible pasts and futures of this. Anyway, for just to begin, I'd like to talk his, the idea, this, this concern with presence has a very long history. And uh, we can go back to the caves at Lascaux, to the, to the tombs in Luxor, to pick the Baroque cathedral of your choice, to the panorama or the, or the, the cineorama in the case of that uh, other, the black and white picture. And all of these address a concern that Robert Barker talked about in his, um, in his uh, patent for the panorama in 1781. And he uses the language being as if on the spot. Um, I just have to make note of the time here or I'll forget, go too long. Um, and so this is an obsession with presence that's really important, but it's, it's fundamentally different from being there with agency. And that I think is what distinguishes telepresence. We've had a long concern with presence, uh, and, and the fanzayer in this, in this case, the, the old word for the telescope, uh, is an interesting one because it resonates with the German word for fanzayen, um, television, I guess you could say. Uh, we we kind of straddles two eras, the idea of being somewhere else but, but not being able to do something, or with television, and I'll show you why I say this, being somewhere and being able to do something with some forms of TV possible. Um, Anyway, let me just start with technology. Um, the middle of the 19th century is a turning point in thinking about presence, and it's a turning point, especially because of the telegraph and especially the transatlantic cable or what becomes transatlantic, transpacific, transoceanic. Um, and the development of this cable system seems to spark a flurry of imagination. I would say really from 1830s onwards, 1830 being the year that photography, telegraphy, and computation are all prototyped. It's a very, very interesting year. But to jump ahead, this is a period ripe with fantasies about technology um, that, I mean, crazy fantasies, ensembles of, of, of things that could never possibly work together, but doesn't matter. An evocative era, but it's an era in which these kinds of developments emerge. Things like the telegraph, uh, the telephone, the, the pan telegraph, the, in other words, the image, the build, the build telegraph, the image telegraph, Baird's televisor, which in a certain way is a realization through Paul Nipko in Germany for a TV patent based in 1884. Uh, Flammarion's um, telephonoscope evokes that. So this is a period ripe with invention, fantasy, and the, and the mingling of the two. Also with really interesting developments that we tend to forget uh, in the case of Germany and nationwide television telephone grid uh, that existed from 38 till pretty much the end of the war. So implementation of, of forms of interacting, of being telepresent that don't always loom large in our imagination. I just wanna tease out in the next few minutes a couple of the thematics that really stand out to me in looking at these, the, the kinds of illustrations and uses of these various um, of these various telepresence devices. And one of the crucial ones, one of the most emphatic and, and insistent 
uh, is colonization. So this is an image that's often talked about as the first representation, the first imagination and image form of what we would today call television. It's a couple seated in England and they're talking to their daughter on the screen using something like a telephone. So if you remember, the telephone is, is mid 1870s. So this is a you know, pretty early fantasy to have in terms of like, not just sh of shackling the telephone to the ability to see. And, and in seeing, shackling it to a global project of colonization and control. So their daughter is in Salon and they're having a chat. And if I go through the early, here's a fantasy technology, this thing you know, doesn't exist, but look at the background and we're in Asia. Or this is back to Albert Robida, this is 1884, 1883, 1884. Um, the, beautiful, the beautiful expression, the suppression of absence as a way to speak to the presence that these technologies can afford. But if you look out the window, again, this is enabling strategy for actual colonial presence without, without taking care of the suppression, without, taking, without suppressing absence, colonial forces go crazy and cease to be functional. So this is a, a really kind of interesting and insistent way here. Here the <laughs> chocolate. This is actually a German card uh, that was a, um, but it, it was a it was an, an international market, and in this case, the Africans watching French, the French telephonoscope. So cultural exchange, and perhaps perhaps another step in the in the in the in the in the, in the work of colonization. So that's that's a really insistent one throughout this period. The idea of global control uh, through through tele telepresence. Uh, convenience is another, you know, it's easy to talk about this as kind of trivial marketing, it is, but convenience in the, in the Latin sense of bringing together, or in the obsolete English sense of, um, of congruity, and, and congruities show up in all kinds of ways. This is Albert Robita, again, from a wonderful book, uh, Le XXe Siècle, 1883, 1884, uh, where the spectator, you can see him, he's quite small there, is looking at this massive screen, but it's the news. It's bringing another part of the war, war, world, and in this case, the uh, what in English is called the Boxer Rebellion, bringing that to us as a, to inform the citizenry or entertainment. Uh, another way to do it, of course. Typically, these 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 uh, conveniences, these these um, tele services are, are are pretty literal, like selling fish or or having doctors' visits. Things we've grown accustomed to in the COVID. Uh, age. Um, here's some anticipations from the 1920s of the uh, at MIT. Now we have all of our doctors' visits are pretty much take this form. They're tele doctor visits, anticipated here in 1924. Uh, and I guess Amazon has already shown the power of buying stuff, buying our clothing online. Uh, by the way, this is the Hugo Gernsbach uh, that we heard about a little earlier. Uh, he did radio news. He was also a science fiction editor of science fiction uh, journal and an inventor. Interesting character. Um, behind this, there are two kinds of, and this resonates with the, with, uh, uh, the last talk. Uh, uh, th there's a kind of epistemological, but also an ontological uncertainty. Epistemologically speaking, and Jeffrey Sconce has done wonderful work on this in his book called Haunted Media, lurking behind many of these technologies are stories of uncertainty about what exactly uh, we're in touch with when we telepresent. I, I put St. Clair, the patron saint of television, and Ezekiel here, um, whose vision of God's chariot was, you know, there's a whole history of these kinds of telepresences. Like, now we, I, I guess I'm a little dubious about these, but but uh, and they're not technologized in the way I want to talk about. But I do want to point to them as as part of a tradition that leads to this Bell and Watson with the telephone. Who knew that Watson spent the next couple of years after the invention of the telephone listening to effectively static on the lines, thinking they might be voices of the departed, of the dead? Because if energy is neither created or destroyed. Where does the energy of life go when it leaves the body? And is that something that's being picked up by these wires? Is that in fact, so there's a whole history, you know, uh, poltergeist where the, where the spirit comes to the TV, whatever. There's a whole history of this that really speaks to a kind of fundamental uncertainty. And if I look to the early advertisements for 
television. So this is the televisor. These are ads from the 1920s. It's so interesting that they that this is a magic. Okay, it's a magic device. It's a wonder device. Man's strangest dream. But there's a as the as the clairvoyant and the upset woman discovering something with her relationship. There, there's something about this that there's an uncanniness that lurks behind a lot of these. The introduction of a lot of these technologies. I haven't yet seen it with Zoom. It's probably coming, but. Uh, whole genre of films that deals with this as well, um, where it, invariably it's a person that's committing the murders, but at first it's the, the, the suspicion falls upon the technology, which is intriguing. Ontological confusion as well. This is a really, another very interesting domain. So if you look at the reactions of the spectators, it's as if there's an uncertainty about co-presence. Uh, is this happening in their space? There's a sense of shock. This is very literal in the case of early cinema. And for a good 15 years, there are persistent cartoons. The one on the, on the left is, uh, is from Russia. So this is from, pre, from, from pre-revolutionary Russia of a, of a farmer <laughs> uh, being prepared to stop the train. Uh, another one on the right from, from, from England and another British one uh, with Cockneys, usually there's a class critique uh, embedded in these. Um, but nevertheless, they speak to an uncertainty about what is present and what is not present, what is in the room and what isn't in the room. D.W. Griffith has a series of films that he made articulating precisely the, the, the concern about partial presence. So in this case, the telephone, this is uh, the, the Lonely Villa, uh, a woman is uh, at uh, the, the husband goes off to work, the woman and the kids are at home, and some burglars come into the house. She calls her husband, who's at work, and walks him through step by step. And now they're breaking down the front door. Lock yourself in the bedroom. Now they're coming up the steps. Barricade the door. Now they're, now they're attacking the bedroom door. And the, the husband's paralysis is, is because of a kind of ontological confusion. Acoustically, he's present in the room but physically he's, he's miles away. It's a Griffith film. So of course there's a, there's a, there's a reconciliation, a happy ending. He gets there just in time. A very similar story only with the telegraph in this case, the lonely, uh, the Lone Dale operator, but there's a bunch of these that, that sort of try to tease out the anxieties of being partially present. That, that's an anxious condition when we're almost there, but not quite not enough there to intervene or make a difference. Um, Another space, of course, uh, where that pops up, and certainly at the end of the 19th century, when, when sexuality was being renegotiated, when, when new heterosexual spaces were, were popping up in society, there is a genre of postcards, and a friend, uh, Jan Olsen in Stockholm, must have, he has hundreds of these uh, postcards that, that, that play with this idea of the telephone as enabling that connectivity that would be otherwise transgressive in, in, in real life. Uh, Albert Robida also has it, Effusion Telephonoscopique, wonderful way to say it. Uh, of course, there's a darker edge to it, and 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 uh, could also look at this as surveillance, which of course it is. But there's a kind of uh, objectification and you know illicit the illicit gaze. Where that comes crashing home, and it's detailed in a wonderful book by Carolyn Marvin, When Old Technologies Renew was in the person of the telephone girl. At the end of the 19th century, start of the 20th, at least in the US, one of the services, wealthy people had phones, right? These were not common items. One of the services that the, the telephone company uh, um, provided its customers was a wake up service. And what that meant is that the first voice the man of the family heard in the morning was the voice of the telephone girl. And this created incredible, like really a, a number of novels and stories. And, and it really created a lot of anxiety, uh, especially for women, that the voice that would wake up the man was not the wife's voice, but the, but the telephone girl's voice. And what, what could this lead to? What about this partial presence, much as we've seen in those other more anxiety, well, this is still anxiety producing, but in a very, uh, in the sense that the public is penetrating the domestic, and it's a gendered public. Surveillance is, is, is obvious, we know and talk a lot about it, but there's also something about telepresence that deals with this idea of a surfeit of, uh, of information. Um, 
whole genre of cartoons of uh, before television. These are anticipations of television where the, the concern is that it reveals too much. It's, it's a kind of uncontrollable presence. This is a great example where the telephone is pretty good if you need to, you, you want to get a limited amount of information across, but add video to that and sometimes too much information is revealed or you need to really put on a mask to get the real story across. So this anxiety about too much information, the control scenarios um, we know all too well. Mystery of the Leaping Fish, by the way, one of the strangest films ever made, Doug Fairbank, America's, every American boy's hero. And I mean, what a strange film. Um, I love the child actor in this image, <laughs> so the surveilled kid who knows it. Okay, telepresence. Um, again, a long history of this idea of extending action through, uh, through some newfangled technology. Again, this is from, the, from 1924, so it's a pre-television in the sense that we know it. We, we know this kind. The remote has a very long and history, uh, interesting history. But this is one that's really kind of, it's astounding. The, 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 um, the Germans, especially from about 41, 42 onwards, start to make mini cameras that serve as guidance systems, telepresence guidance systems. So, so the, you could, the engineers inside the plane could basically steer a rocket. It was connected by a very thin wire and they could watch these kinds of images. Um, so, so a guided missile technology, essentially. And this it evolves before the, end of the, before the end of the war into heat-seeking missile technology. This is largely prototype. They're producing a couple of hundred cameras a month by the end of the war, uh, not field deployed, but field tested. So telepresence in that ominous sense that, that of course it is taken on uh, with us today. Uh, um, I think I need to wind down here. So I just want to invoke both Karl Marx and Rudolf Arnheim in, in one breath here. Uh, this idea of the annihilation of time and space is something that Marx talks about in the Grundrisse in a, in a really interesting way. Rudolf Arnheim picks it up in his book, Film as Art. And in 1935, he has an essay there about the forecast of a new medium. And it's a forecast of television. And he talks about television as something that's going to annihilate uh, time and space. So we know, of course, in these earlier 19th century depictions that it brings the theater to the home or the theater to the bedroom, um, that it allows us to be present and non-present at the same time. This is a very familiar <laughs> scenario to us today, but this is obviously from the 1920s when you could fly into the cafe and and ignore one another. Um, but this image I, I, is one I want to almost stop with. And this is um, a lot of our concern, and this goes to the bigger point about presence versus representation. A lot of the work on Nazi propaganda tends to look at the iconography, tends to look at the angle of the cameras or the squareness of the Aryan jaw or the that, that sort of stuff. In fact, the genius of propaganda in the Third Reich was its understanding of how broadcast media, radio and television, there's daily public television in Berlin from March 1935 until the end of the war, and it's imagined as fitting a scenario that, that radio really fulfilled, would actually construct the, the neural network for a new Volkskörper, for a new public, a public that would be enabled by connectivity, by live transmission of information. This is an astounding to me and very provocative uh, understanding of, of, of telepresence, of, of this kind of connectivity and creation of a public, both in the sense that this could send, like the, like the nervous, uh, like nerves, this can send information to the center, but it can send the central messaging of the center to the periphery. And this is literally how uh, there's, a, there's a plan, uh, a secret plan the post office made the, the, the Post and the Propaganda Ministry both controlled TV, Post controlled infrastructure and news. They had plans, and they hated each other, plans for post-victory television in Europe, where the Post Ministry could kill off the Propaganda Ministry. How? Because they would have a 24-7 news network, television news network throughout Europe, controlling the rhythms of everyday life. Who needs propaganda? It's genius. And um, 
Okay, so just to end, I guess to all this to say, one of the things I find so fascinating about the discourse and the and the and the practices of telepresence is that they're really a heuristic to try to figure out what is presence. What does presence entail? Presence is a murky thing. As I said, it's an under-articulated space. Someone like uh, Hans Ulrich Gumprecht has done wonderful work on trying to make an argument for a counter a, a counter reality, if you will. To the reality of representation, there's the reality of presence. And that, that presence is, it slides off uh, awfully quickly into kind of um, awkward ideological space, it's true. Uh, but that said, I, I think one of the best heuristics we have for it is telepresence and, and the arts. And the more fumbling and failed, the more sharply we can see the contours of, of what's missing in the present. And I think with that, I will... Um, I will stop sharing my screen and. Uh... Thank you very much for sure. uh, being uh, present, for uh, finishing even uh, earlier my estimated time. Hey, that's amazing. Uh, yeah, no one has done this before in this in this event. Uh, so this. Um, thank you again for bringing us into these histories of presence. Um, presence and absence, and uh, bringing this perspective of uh, actually our being together is uh, saying that this being together is convenience, because I would think of it as inconvenience, but it actually, um, using the Latin etymology that you mentioned, is convenience. Well, I think, you know, like you said at the beginning, um, I found with, so I have a lab, we have lectures, physical face-to-face mm -hmm. -face lectures, free lunch. I actually even. was a part of your lab back in 2011. You probably don't remember. I do, I do, I do. Yeah. So, so, and, and what happened when we went to Zoom is that suddenly our audiences went from 40 or 50 to 300 and 400. So it's and suddenly a new reach of speakers. No, it's 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 got affordances. But that's again a different audience. Uh, yep. That's not yep. the same hundred people, right? Yep. So they're seeing us, they can also reply to us, but they are not present in the same way. That's true. Yep. So that thinness of experience, that's I think the thing we need to think mm -hmm. about. What is the character of that thinness? That yep. absolutely. Thank you. So I'll give the word to Satomi at this point. Satomi, are you with us? Yeah. We are not. Okay. Oh, let me see. Okay, I need to. So, yeah, share screen. Uh -huh. Okay, and you are sharing, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. Okay. And can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Natalia, for inviting me and joining me uh, to uh, participate and in this uh, exciting uh, event. And uh, I think the, I was actually kind of expecting a little more informal setting. So uh, we'll see how it goes, but uh, uh, so uh, my name is Satomi uh, Sugiyama and my, tight, uh, com uh, my talk is titled Still We Cannot Touch After Decades of Perpetual Contact and Absent Presence. And just to give you some like my backgrounds um, uh, is I'm coming from the mobile communication research. That's uh, where I, I studied my this primary research. Uh, when I was a long time ago, uh, graduate school. And uh, then uh, from there, I also like I developed my research area to uh, issues related to the wearable technologies. Um, also, like I do like a research on the fashion fashion studies, and uh, also re uh, recently more like social robots. So these are the kind of issue that I um, look at, and my background is communication media studies. So, and uh, actually, the uh, professor Richard's uh, talk was uh, really, really uh, interesting and actually like, gave me a lot of info, uh, ideas, insights to develop my current research that I'm going to uh, uh, talk about and the great theoretical insights that I uh, uh, just like, uh, gained. So, so uh, let me just uh, talk about this. So uh, 
so uh, I actually like met Natalia uh, at the end of November in our conference. Uh, we were talking, I was uh, talking about um, wearable technologies interface and particularly focusing on the issue of touch. So that's what I'm going to like uh, mainly focus on today. Uh, but then like nowadays, particularly with this, uh, this uh, lockdown, global like pandemic issues, like social distancing has just become a really, um, it's um, almost like a buzzword. We just hear it like everywhere. And we see that this is some of the uh, examples that we saw, we saw similar image everywhere in the media, in different cultural contexts, I'm sure from the, instead of handshaking to like, uh, elbow touch, and also the, in the, the hospitals, how people cannot actually meet somebody physically, somebody that they cared about, care, care, care about, and they cannot meet physically. So how they actually um, using this uh, technology, something like a tablet to get in touch. So uh, after I go through some of the like main points that I like to uh, present, talk about today, and I also like uh, just hint a little bit of this uh, like connection with the current pandemic situation and how our sense of touch and also the uh, presence has been affected. Okay, so okay, let's see. okay, here we go. Okay, so uh, just very briefly, the uh, mobile revolution. Uh, the what my uh, coming from the mobile communication research. Uh, some of the work, uh, this is uh, like Rainey and Wellman's work and Professor uh, Wellman's work has been very uh, important influential in the area of the research that I do in the triple revolution. And the triple revolution meaning a social network revolution, internet revolution, mobile revolution, and all of these things uh, uh, emphasize how, who we can get in touch, who can be, who we can get connected and communicate and how close these uh, ICTs become, come to our body. So uh, mobile revolution, uh, the, the Iranian woman talked about, uh, like I see uh, uh, ICTs are our body appendage. And this also closely connects to my research that I have been doing the mobile, uh, mobile phone and the fashion in relation to the body. And uh, this condition of this trip revolution led to this uh, so-called networked individualism, how we become the like really the operating system. And uh, we are the kind of portal. We in connection with our ICTs is it just become the sort of like portal for connection. So we function more as a connected individual rather than embedded group, social, uh, like a group members. So this idea of the connected me became so important um, in this under this condition of the networked individualism and triple revolution. And looking at this like a mobile phone, uh, mobile communication, starting from this really big first uh, Motorola Martin Cooper's first mobile phone to this is more like, uh, like 90s and the old so-called feature phone. Uh, in the context of this is uh, coming from the Japan, uh, I mode from the candy bar, so-called candy bar phone to the flip phone, uh, and now uh, very familiar um, uh, phones, like uh, these most recent uh, iPhones and smartphones. So the interface uh, just continue to change and how the telephone and how we actually touch and interact with this object also like uh, continue to change. Right, but uh, and uh, but uh, then, like as we interact with these technologies, uh, the some of the thing that we've been doing, and uh, me and also like my colleagues has been uh, looked at, particularly uh, when the mobile communication research was really, um, uh, how can you say, the uh, early two thousands. Uh, I worked with a lot of mobile phone researchers uh, around the world. And some of the uh, issues that we really looked at was how we interact with this mobile device and how we actually invest our emotions onto these objects. Right? So like into these objects and also like an emotional engagement with, of course, somebody who are present right, over the distance 
that this mobile phone allowed us to get connected. And uh, at one point, I was also looking at this sort of the, how they actually also like invest their emotions in decorating uh, their mobile phone. Um, and uh, also like the kind of backbone of what uh, I have been uh, I, con I have been looking at in relation to the mobile communication research, and uh, and in the um, interaction, the um, this is the maybe I can show a little no, no, no. okay so so the way that that when the mobile phone com mobile communication and so the, in Japan. So the uh, smartphone uh, started to really get disseminated. And this was one of the, um, um, the commercial like entity Docomo, major uh, te telecommunication, mobile communication providers, uh, commercials, TV commercials. And uh, they are actually like using this swiping. So it's swipe right, swipe left, and uh, just to really kind of, uh, uh, disseminate and make people aware of the, how people actually interact with this like, smartphone object and touch screen. And this was also like a very interesting example of how does the way that we touch this object right, became an important part of this kind of cultural reference and the kind of cultural experience. Right? And from a mobile phone from carrying to wearing, uh, so the famous example of the 1980s, Steve Mann's Wacom, this really big object that people are wearing to the Google Glass. So the, we started to see the, uh, uh, the sort of like a change, the way that we were used, we used to say that, yes, we wear the mobile in a way that we, um, like more like a metaphorical sense of wearing the mobile. But that now this actually wearing became a really uh, part of our everyday practice uh, gradually. Right? So uh, as uh, Rosalind Pickard says, wearable, uh, wearables could become as comfortable and convenient as wearing a watch. Right? So of course we see this um, um, smart watch quite prevalent nowadays. And we can also see that something like a Google Jacquard project and how this like a small tag tip can be embedded into the, uh, our everyday clothing and connected to our smartphone. And this also have a collaboration with this um, jackets and um, bags, right? So, uh, and also like a connections and collaboration with a major fashion brands, right? So, uh, so like these are just the example of the like different sort of the interface and changes how the uh, we have been interacting with different sort of shapes of the like mobile communication device with a different interface, right? and uh, uh, these are some of the uh, issues that the uh, like mobile communication researchers identified, particularly in relation to relational consequences. Because my interest is really the uh, personal relationship with, with these technologies. So um, Katz and Arcas talked about the perpetual contact. So like a uh, telephone, yes. So like the, with a mobile communication, uh, mobile phone, we were able to actually stay connected with people that we care about, right? Or actually, it's just for also like for just to get things done as well. So like this, uh, the, this we could, this created this uh, um, situation of perpetual contact. So we are constantly con get connected to people. And uh, Christian Likop, at this time he was working at uh, French Telecom. He was also like talking about this connected presence. So with this perpetual contact, does not necessarily mean we are always always talking to people or just uh, texting, talking to people, but we actually have this presence. So like that we can experience the presence of another people just through having this mobile device. So connected presence. This also like uh, uh, leads, led to this idea of this absent presence. So uh, both like uh, Leopoldina Fortunati and Kenneth Gergen talked about this idea of the absent presence. So we can actually feel somebody's presence, right? even though they are physically absent. And the, so this is actually like also a very interesting point that the, uh, the 
my previous talks, I was actually talking about this, how this uh, partial presence, of course, telepresence, ontological confusion, and being anxious, like all of these concepts are really uh, are very um, can intertwine this idea of this absent presence that mobile, tele uh, mobile communication could uh, introduce into our um, everyday life. Right? So, and there's different uh, ideas that uh, just like posted here, uh, listed here. But I think for me, it's uh, right now. It's but it's very interesting and also like made me think about as I look reflect upon the idea of the touch and also mediated touch and under this uh, this lockdown um, social distancing uh, like situation that we went through and we are still going through is uh, this two highlighted point perpetual contact and absent presence seems to be a very interesting sort of like a conceptual framework to keep in mind and reflect upon. And so to so touch. So as I said, uh, uh, like touch, we touch this, these objects. So like interaction with technologies interface, we are still like primarily relying on touching this object from the just uh, like very um, kind of light touch in the screen to pressing buttons. Right? And of course we can do this uh, like voice uh, command and also like nowadays, uh, uh, Lucien Fauri talks about the technology and technologies are interacting each other, just sort of like a human's presence is sort of like a disappearing, just that becoming a background. So all this like, new change and uh, um, development is happening, but in the everyday practice, still we are interacting with technologies, interface using touch. And then like a touch associated with emotional experience is also a very important point to keep in mind because because uh, this touching is not just to like simply uh, operate these machines or with much more than functional operation of technologies. And uh, this uh, uh, David and Cambridge's uh, interesting uh, research about the screen intimacy, they looked at this, how the, um, the dating up and the people actually like this sort of like, they're like intimacy, uh, which is heavily connected to these embodied experiences are actually sort of reduced to this interacting with this screen. So like swipe right, swipe left, up and down. And it's sort of like our intimacy is actually just becoming sort of happening within the screen and also interacting with these devices using a touch, but a touch on the screen and device. Right? And on the other side, touch in the just more like in general, more like um, this human communication, it is uh, really the, uh, the one of the very important non-verbal communication calls to communicate relational messages, not just not about the, what we say, but actually what, who are we? Right? So uh, in this, you can say that depending on the relational, uh, nature of the relationship, um, uh, like how you can touch, where you can touch right? is different. So there's a lot to do with the relational messages, the affections, and also like the uh, like communication of the power as well. And also this like the practice of touch haptics is also very cultural and cultural rituals as well. So, so as I said, uh, as I showed at the beginning, this like elbow touch, right? So like this is like because we can operate in this, uh, let's say, you know, let's say global business setting, handshake is a very sort of a common, uh, greeting practice and I'm coming from Japan and uh, I mean like in the business settings that we handshake but we are not very touchy uh, kind of culture but this uh, so but I think this kind of culture rituals of how we touch to each other what's okay what is expected what is not okay what is not uh, accepted right? so this is a very sort of cultural um, practice as well so uh, what I'm very interested right now, and what I'm just going to present is a really sort of initial stage of my research. Uh, and uh, so, and it's more like what I'm going to talk about, it's more of the, just to, uh, just more like just stimuli for us to actually think about this issue rather than actual conclusive, uh, conclusive sort of like uh, research results and also like some uh, like conclusion. But uh, like my like my thought is really, do we desire to communicate our touch over distance? And uh, this was this is kind of interesting that uh, so like I mean you cannot you have to like maintain this like social distance. So 
through, this is not actually a screen, they're physically there, but through the glass window, they actually kind of try to touch to each other. And do we want to do those, if we cannot do, we cannot actually touch another person, yes, right? And I think it's actually the, uh, when I was talking with my friend, for instance, during this like uh, social distance time, once in a while, we just kind of, okay, yes, so let's just, uh, we just do this, right? So, and I mean, it's, this is, seems to be kind of more spontaneous. It shouldn't be the ritual in the end of this panel, but should all yeah. do that, like. <laughs> So this is uh, kind of various kind of spontaneous reactions that we actually have, right? Uh, but if we can actually use the device to actually mediate the touch, and if you can feel another person's the touch pressure and warmth, do we want that? And this was the, uh, actually I was thinking already about this um, uh, last fall before this uh, lockdown period. And then like, this issue became, uh, just, of course I keep coming back to my mind, do we want this? Do people want this? So uh, what I did, and I'm just currently working on is, I found uh, several uh, kind of prototype or the device that are available um, to communicate touch. So these are the, like some of the touch, uh, like this like, device that I found. And so the one touch bracelet. So they call it to send your loved one your touch anytime you want to and anywhere they are, right? So like this is like bracelet that you buy like the uh, pair of bracelet and you, you can kind of see this uh, from this slide that you can see you basically the, um, uh, it's connected to your um, phone and up, and then you can actually uh, like send the touch. And if the, your relational partner can be a couple, can be a friends, uh, wearing the like this uh, bracelet, and then they can feel the vibration, and also that it actually uh, just kind of lights up. So that's the way to like say, okay, I'm thinking about you, thinking about you. And this is very similar to the uh, the way that people use uh, mobile phone and texting. Because like very often we exchange our text for no reason, just say hi, right? And also like uh, circulating, just sending some sort of like a memes, right? That can be actually like the meme content could be very important, but it could be just really that sort of like, um, sort of like a fatigue communication. I'm just thinking of you, right? So this is just one of the uh, like uh, device that I, I looked at. And then this, uh, this is a haptic gloves. Um, I know there is more like the uh, actual product that are used in the gaming world and VR uh, virtual re uh, reality, but uh, this was um, more like uh, like Simon Fraser University's. Um, I think it's a um, the haptic glove. So you uh, like one person have a glove, another person have a glove, and you can actually like share the vibrations, and also you can actually like feel like uh, some you're holding hand with another person, and forever is very similar. Uh, you can also like a convey that sort of a handshake, right? And then, okay, hug shirt. Uh, this is coming from the uh, company called uh, like Cute Circuit. So this is also like a connected to the app and then a connected to the, uh, with a Bluetooth to this hug shirt. And then you can communicate a hug. And Kissinger, this is a very interesting one. <laughs> so, so you put the mobile phone into this device and then you can actually communicate kiss, right? And it can be the like romantic kiss, but also that can be the just very like, um, very just expression of affection with the, like, to your children, your family members, right? So this is a Kissinger. And uh, what I'm interested in is not to really do evaluate this particular product. So like I use this as just a sort of like prompt and stimuli for people to uh, actually think about if this, would you, are you interested in using something like this? Right? And also not specifically this device, but there's something similar to that. Okay. So what I found, so like this is, uh, it's really preliminary research. It's a convenience sampling and 60 people participated. And all the different age group, mostly the young people, like around 20s, but the, the older one just went up to like a six years old. old. And I looked at, as I said, that this uh, like nonverbal communication touch is quite cultural. 
So I asked, okay, so like what kind of like cultural background, greeting habits do you have in, in a culture where you grew up? So like hugs, kisses, handshake, no contact, kisses and hugs. So this is what they, are, they usually greet with another person. So just do like an estimate. And then this is uh, uh, the bar represent how much, how, like how you are interested in using a device like this, like with close friends. And next slide, it actually shows that like your romantic partner. And this is a seven point liquid scale. So, and also very small sample size. So just to just get the sort of like sense of the response so far. But uh, like in general, if you consider this is like a seven point liquid scale, people are not so interested in using this device from bracelet, gloves, Prebo is also hand holding and Hakshas, Kiss, uh, Kissinger. They are not so much interested in mediating, communicating. Uh, uh, this touch, like right? oh, this different form of touch, like through technologies, right? and the same thing for that. And slightly higher with uh, like relational partners, but still they are not so much interested in this. Right? And and some of them, I'm like right now, I'm looking at this like okay, what what do they say? Why they are interested? Why they are not interested? Right. And a lot of things just come from the kind of skepticism that they have. Right? So they're like, it's not a real thing. And uh, so this is, this is a primary theme. So like just, uh, I have some of the uh, things, items, uh, answers listed here, but I also read it here from the, some, uh, like, um, something I have here. And something like, uh, let's say uh, like bond touch bracelet, some of the comments, like, I mean, if it's actually that this kind of like a touch that you have, you you feel in the uh, in the bracelet, it might actually make you feel miss more the person more. And uh, also, it says it's a way to make yourself present uh, presence even far away. And that's kind of interesting that uh, sort of like the by having this kind of like uh, touch, like mediation of the touch and communication of the touch over the distance. The, some of these people said it actually feel, rather than feeling close and connected to their uh, relational partner or their friends, actually feel distant from them or like miss more from them. And um, also like something interesting, I, I do not feel inanimate object beyond my wedding rings. That's also very interesting because the wedding ring is also like a part of their cultural, uh, like a ritual. And like something new doesn't quite fit into their sort of like a concept and mindset. So, um, so what you see is, and also like here in the glove, uh, the soft touch of real fresh is intrinsic and real. So, so basically they're saying this mediated touch is not real. It's a cool concept, yeah, but it's just not gonna be replaced. It's just different. And uh, comments for the Kissinger, I would rather wait and kiss them in person. Uh, just weird, real or nothing. I prefer to do it in person. I, I'd rather say kiss for a true person and so on. I, so, um, so like just general sentiment we can see is that this is not a way to um, uh, make that, uh, and the absence of the part, like uh, absent, like absent person to be more present, right? Uh, just something that is just, they're just general, generally they're like not interested and they are not really enthusiastic about these devices, even though these are available. Right? So the, like just, this is just the last question, uh, last slide and just, 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 I'm gonna go back to this uh, question. Do we desire to mediate our touch over distance? And I started, uh, I, I just kind of titled this talk, we still, we cannot touch, right? Because that's, uh, we feel like, yes. So like we can text, we can hear, we can just, like, we can actually like uh, communicate, like all the things over distance with this, uh, this te technologies nowadays. And I, I think like in reflecting upon that what we, uh, experience so during the lockdown, I think we definitely feel like, okay, like I actually feel like I, I'm so glad that we have this technology that I can actually stay in touch. And it's just also like the, we kind of created the sort of like a new normal just to actually have this kind of conference like this and also the uh, 
uh, this from Zoom uh, uh, drinks and parties. I think that's also something that was uh, quite um, common. I actually even got to meet with my old friend in Japan just over drink uh, via Zoom. And this thing just became a sort of like so-called new normal and I really appreciate that. But do we desire to mediate more senses using this technology? I think this still just uh, remains a question to me. And I, I really uh, like to investigate more of these questions. So like, yes, no, maybe depends. Maybe it's, this is this is a very big question, and so I think I think this nuance analysis is definitely very important. And I think that how this uh, current situation that we go through, uh, we are going through, affects I, uh, my kind of like I might be changing uh, the, our desire and the wish to mediate or touch over distance. And perhaps it's just a matter of time. So perhaps it's just we are not used to it. And somehow we just feel it's not socially desirable and acceptable at the moment, but maybe just the way that uh, we got so used to talking, looking at people, so like a visual became just very uh, like a uh, kind of like an everyday part of this like mediated interaction nowadays. Maybe it's just a matter of getting used to it. So, uh, so I think I just for me this is a really the, still like very open question, and uh, do we. But uh, I kind of my I, I still kind of keep this in sort of like a back of my ha my head that perhaps we actually want to keep this uh, absent presence and connected presence as it is uh, because there's just something this is um, kind of more to desire that makes actually like affect our emotions in a certain way and the way that we actually uh, develop and maintain the relationship. So, so that's my current thought, but uh, so just, uh, uh, so like as I said, my talk is more like just, uh, uh, just something just to think about for the future conversation rather than really conclusive uh, research results, but I hope uh, like something that maybe like in line with uh, experiences and, and the thoughts that some of you are actually um, kind of going through at the moment. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Satomi. Yeah, um, the recurring thought which I had uh, during Ksenia's, Williams and Satomi's talk. Uh, so what uh, Ksenia did, she, uh, as, as uh, I sense that she has translated uh, for us or explain the mechanics of the affect and brought into the stage this idea of transmutality and traversing sense and thinking regions of the body and um, how the uh, knowledge is actually produced uh, in, the, uh, in the act. And um, here uh, in regards with this history of presence that William was talking about and what I was thinking when Satomi was talking that actually the bond bracelet presents the absence rather than uh, reminds of presence. It sort of makes absence more clear than you see that the absence <laughs> is more clear. So what I was thinking about and the question that I would like to open up our discussion with. So once we uh, are partially partially present for this three months, we are partially present in all this situation. So what what has actually happened to us? So what is the way of writing history of partial presence? Like we know how to write the history of uh, you know present presence. I keep asking myself what what has happened to me in this three months? I haven't really seen anyone. I haven't really gone anywhere. But something has happened. So what? What? What is this? So I would ask this question to uh, any of the speakers who wants to to who has something to say. Well, I'll say something. I'm not sure we can, well, do, you, can do much you about have it. To be answering but directly, I, but I have to say that my dream life has. So I had COVID for two months. So that could oh, be. Did you maybe really? That, maybe that was it. But I had the most vivid dreams of my life. Uh, night after night, and I kept thinking it had to be compensating for the the kind of experiential, mm -hmm. because I had to stay in the house, right. I didn't really go out. Mm -hmm. It was all the kind of normal senses I would get in the course of a day with people, but also with nature or whatever. 
came flooding in colors. I mean, colors mm-hmm. I'd never seen before. It was pretty incredible and persistent. And um, so, th- so how does one document that? How does one give give form and coherence <laughs> to that to that murky domain? But that's for sure one place where I noticed a huge difference. Um, Actually, that's very surprising. I, I also had the unbelievable dreams, even though I, I was walking out, but I've, I've actually never had dreams as vivid as this. Anybody, anybody else has any thoughts? Laura, I know you had a question. Yes, thank you. Um, so thank you all for, for your presentation. And I think all the objects that we were talking and the illustrations were about shortening the distance between the people that still can uh, miss each other or touch each other. That's why maybe some of the research of Satomi sh- show that the, they feel the lack of presence. But what, are, what about if we change a little bit the perspective for people that cannot touch anymore, maybe they will find uh, the, um, yes. <laughs> For example, the people that is, that is dead already, and maybe you will find this kisser or this touch more more comfortable experience because you cannot feel the lack. I don't know if you have some talk, comment about it, Satomi. No, but that, but that that's my thought, and I'm actually like uh, hoping to uh, do the similar research now. That just uh, like sort of it's more like accidental before and after sort of situation. So I would like that definitely. I'm not quite sure if I'm gonna use exactly the same um, kind of the stimuli and product, but probably something very similar. And I'd like to ask, but now how do people feel <laughs> about this using this technology? And uh, I think that it's one thing when it's essential, the other thing uh, when it's not essential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I think it's for this, I think qualitative studies and qualitative data will be very important. I think still people are thinking the feeling like, well, particularly that something like a Kissinger, like something is just like, like like mediating, like uh, like sending the kiss to like over distance using technology. People seem to feel a bit, uh, um, kind of uncomfortable saying, yes, I love to do this. Right, but the, I think it's a uh, I think more like very nuanced qualitative analysis will probably uh, find a really interesting results and uh, and uh, uh, so I think yeah I'm very curious to see how people uh, idea has changed I think there's a different way that I can collect data as well the, I can also like do an internet ethnography or something along the line but uh, if like any of you have some like a reflection of it I actually that's something I wanted to have. Uh, I, I would be happy to to write you what what I think. Yeah. That's so many, maybe that can be the follow up of this conference that yeah. every one of us writes a so little text mm-hmm. about this this month yeah. or creates an artwork. That's actually an, that's an yeah. option. A question. Oh, go ahead. Sorry? Okay, we have a question for William. Uh, so the study of the beginning of all these technologies can also help us to predict where it will come. So, what is your vision about? the predictions now and how will be the future. William, switch on the microphone. Um, So first of all, I think a lot of of what we've discussed today has been kind of more haptic and more with neurological Mm tie-ins. And that obviously is all post second world war uh, development. So so, um, I guess the thing I'd say is how quickly the craziest ideas seem normalized. And, and, and at least when I see patterns and ideas, the numbers of images of those colonial things, it really speaks to that, to indeed the, the, the presence of absence and how does, one, how does one deal with that? And people grasp at straws, they grasp at what, this is just a few years after the phone is invented. So they're really thinking incredibly creative about the affor- potential affordances, to, but you know, that to us are completely normal. I live both in Europe and in the States, and I, I'm always missing one side of my family or the other. Thank God for this stuff. It's, it's, it's fantastic. But for, to me, it's, it's transparent. It, and in another era, it was sheer science fiction. So it makes me a real believer in science fiction. It makes me a real believer that the, the research and development wing in technology is fantasy, that that's where it comes from. And that, that I, I remember vividly when I, when I first uh, I went to MIT in 2000 
and all the kids, all the freshmen, all the beginning kids were enamored with, uh, with Star Trek and with the holodeck as kind of the future of what entertainment would be. And it's subsided and we don't hear about it so much, but if I look at what the engineers are actually doing, it's that. That's kind of set the pace and the direction. So, so it's just read science fiction carefully if you want to know what's next. <laughs> Thank you. I, I have a question to, to Ksenia, which actually uh, William was asking in his presentation. I was curious whether Ksenia is a philosopher has an answer, because that's the, the question to, to the philosopher, I think. So maybe I'm maybe I'm slightly changing your presentation, William. This well, that's interpretation, you know, something is lost in this fairly uh, presence or absence. So uh, where does the energy of life go when it's sent over these cables? So it's, it, do you remember what William was saying that, um, about the haunting um, effect uh, of like, thinking of telephone as um, you know, well, voices of dead people? So once we send this life energy of a cable, of the cable, it doesn't reach uh, the receiver fully, right? It doesn't. I mean, some part of it reaches the receiver. Okay, where is this energy? Where is this life energy? <laughs> Yeah, and uh, so I, I mean, think, I'm not sure there is a way to answer this, but right, especially uh, so. So it refers to how do we connect to the dead? Yes, and then how Bell was was well, listening to, to, you, to, to the I was thinking of life. Like, where is this? Where is this life energy? I, I think a philosopher should know where is the life energy. Philosophers only ask questions, <laughs> but the right ones. <laughs> it's very well, you can uh, ask a question back to my question. This is totally oh, okay. Fine. Well, well, I have a few associations, um, both to answer your questions, but also some mm -hmm. thoughts in general in reaction. Sure. Just yeah. talk uh, and so on, or uh, the issues of the discussion. So I think it's um, actually at the beginning uh, when I got the invitation and, and was thinking about uh, what to talk about, um, and also in this situation uh, we are all in, um, all in one. <laughs> so I was thinking, yeah, of course, pretty critically yeah, about um, these opportunities uh, that yes, uh, it's only presence of absence, and uh, there is no substitution for a real human, real sensation, and that's why I want to talk about also intimacy and the physicality of that. But uh, now I'm thinking more about indeed the power of creativity. And this is what I finished uh, with myself, yes, about imagination, that indeed we don't know and we don't know our own reactions to that. And in terms of energies, also, um, uh, yeah, the energy of creativity actually, so that, that we all carry, and the artists especially. So new narratives, new, um, new actors uh, in terms of imaginative actors, so um, characters like, um, well, now we have Japan with us, yes, so I, I was thinking of Tamagotchi and this uh, also affect of uh, caring for a totally non-human and <laughs> um, yeah, technological uh, being, so artificial being, and yet, uh, so what does it mean that uh, media become also uh, well, a way of being for us? Yeah, uh, like literally, so not just mediating our being and our communication, but uh, we um, we rely on them uh, as, uh, yeah, also delivering us not only signals from our communicational partners, yes, but to themselves presenting something. So we should just be more conscious of that as society, not just art audience, of course, we've been conscious of that, but uh, yeah, and to explore the playfulness and the potential, creative potential. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So if I could just add, I mean, there's yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Go ahead. It's a, a thing that does not get talked much about, at least mm -hmm. I haven't heard much about it is the political economic dimension of, of these new platforms. Oh, yeah. And suddenly we're all, you know, there's some debate about is security on Zoom and MIT yeah, has its yeah, conversion, yeah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. But the, the point is there is not a public alternative or not much of a public alternative that we're now, it's as if we've been forced into the shopping mall and that's our new reality. And it kind of works and everything you need is there. But somehow the bigger notion of an open public of a public that's mm -hmm. not commodified, that's not owned by someone, that doesn't have terms of service. S somehow that's just slipped in as a condition, the new enabling condition for any communication. And, and probably that's merits a more critical, careful look. Um, 
we all tend to overlook it. I overlook it because mm -hmm. I'm interested. I need to reach my students. I don't, I have to teach tomorrow. I don't have a choice. But in fact, I, I, it really as a, yeah, requires a lot more critical reflection. Yeah, I absolutely agree with this. Like the um, the notion of this festival, this all all in one, was that suddenly you know it's this uh, Coca Cola situation um, that Warhol was referring to. That it's the same Coke for the rich person and for the for the poor person. Like, uh, we, uh, I have the same Zoom as uh, as you do, and yet, uh, I mean, uh, it's also fifteen dollars to have it, right? Longer than forty minutes. So suddenly we are forced in this forty minutes if uh, if we don't want to pay, and we didn't even know that forty minutes is, you know, a, a measure of uh, unowned public space. It's, it's it's probably not. Yeah. And, it's, and there's no more water. Is the point? Like you don't have a choice. You've got to get Coca Cola because yeah. there is yeah, no more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the water is not. I would say there is no more air because water. I mean, it has been bottled for a long time, but the air. Um, I mean, it's curated by the air conditioning, but still, it's it's very free, available in public. Yeah, there's suddenly no more water or air. Yeah. And and we have um, yeah. We have one more question from Patrick. Uh, in, it's in the chat, actually. Maybe Patrick, you could join. Oh, and, maybe I could just maybe I could just say yeah. is that um, sure. I'll I'll just I'll come on. Is that I mean, in some ways, you know, this being forced into Zoom is that there was, you know, I I've I've done performance art in Second Life for about fifteen years, and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, so what with a group called Second Front, and so the thing is, is that initially that was sort of the capitalist dream of putting you know the world wide web under this neoliberal kind of 3d web paradigm and that sort of thing that everybody's going to want to go to but i think it's interesting that uh, although there are multiple things like here in arabia we also use adobe connect you know it seems like you know zoom has become the the de facto standard in which you know people are now being if not forced you know extremely coerced into coming 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 together for in other words it's sort of a neoliberal shell for web communication and I, I think this is very interesting that the covid um that that covid has kind of created a framework for that happening what do you think Have I done one of my usual sort of things gone on a bit too long and then confused everybody? No, what I'm saying is, is that I'm just wondering whether, you know, there have been other platforms that have wanted to try to consolidate, you know, the internet under, you know, underneath it, or what I'm saying is telepresence. I mean, you, we have Facebook, but you think that Zoom has become, you know, the, the new, the, the new kind of like neoliberal dream for, for telepresence. Well, yeah, totally. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, makes. I mean, so this was the first time ever that that university doors were shut, that that corporation doors were shut, that people were forced. It wasn't an option. There wasn't a choice. Um, you, you more or less to continue your work. You you were you were forced to step over. I, we had plenty of debate about it, but ultimately, like you still had to face the music and teach the kids and uh, get on to Zoom. Um, so I think that's that's kind of unique. We haven't had a moment of this kind of the meltdown of a lot of the other structures, the institutional structures in our life that all of which made that step and, and forced us in. But you're, you're totally right. It was the dream of, of second life for sure. I'm going to be this uh, abrupt um, moderator who says time to watch Welcome to everyone. Thank, Thank you very much, much for, for the speakers for this wonderful discussion. And so I'll uh, uh, announce welcome, welcome to everyone now. <laughs> Thank you again.